you refresh your page? Ah, no, we're live now. You've, you, you started it. Thank you very much. So can I go? Thank you. Right. Hello, everybody. Is anybody out there? Um, my name is Stephen Greer. I am Professor of Human Rights at the University of Bristol Law School in the southwest of England. And I want to make a few remarks, a few general remarks about the nature of injustice and discrimination. And I make a few very, very sketchy suggestions about how it can be tackled. First thing I want to say is that there are many kinds of multidimensional injustice in the world today. And amongst the many complexities um, which make finding and delivering solutions so elusive are the following. Direct and indirect discrimination are not the same things as disadvantage. Discrimination refers to those disadvantages which can't be justified by reference to universal rights and legitimate social interests. Um, not all of them concern race, nor are they all straightforwardly vertical, that is to say, between a minority on the one hand and the majority and or the state on the other. Sadly, minorities can be prejudiced and can discriminate against each other. I'm thinking here of certain religious conservatives and their relationship with LGBT plus and trans people. And also, um, can pass perhaps counterintuitively until you reflect upon it, minorities can also be prejudiced and can discriminate against the majority. Because one of the most enduring and ancient examples is the domination of the vast bulk of any given population by tiny, wealthy and powerful elites. Think of slavery and serfdom, for instance. Any given person in the contemporary, particularly the developed world, is also likely to have multiple identities. This is what's known as super diversity. And one of the many consequences of this for our purposes this afternoon is that someone may be part of the majority or relatively privileged on one dimension, yet part of a disadvantaged minority on another. For example, men in many minority communities tend to have more wealth, power and status than women in the same community. So this raises all kinds of challenges about how these difficulties can be addressed. But I just want to make a few observations about it. First, we need as much scientifically reliable information as possible about the profile of all these problems in different places before we can even begin about thinking about solutions. Second, without certain institutional processes, including strong anti-discrimination machinery, solutions are likely to be even more elusive. Third, also vital are certain social processes, including education and encouragement by the media to put ourselves in the shoes of the other. And one final requirement, this is my last point, is that anti-discrimination movements need to move beyond protest and complaint to the identification of concrete deliverable strategies for change. It's also vitally important to avoid alienating those who may otherwise be open to persuasion. The demand, for example, from some sections of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US to deprive the police of funds as a sanction for racial discrimination, in my view, is a prime example of how not to proceed. So that's it. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, exactly what it says on the, the program to, to the audience as well. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement have brought a new wave of uh, attention to the issues of inequality which might be aggravated by COVID-19. How can we stop discrimination and create a fair future for all? And how to shape societies so that growth that growth benefits the many and not just the few? So Stephen, uh, thank you for that introduction as well. Uh, unfortunately, Alpha and Noel aren't here, but we are joined uh, by Alec and Anino, is it? Absolutely. Fantastic. So I think I'll pass it on to Alec for now and then Nino after to introduce uh, your prim primary thoughts to begin with. And then um, I shall go through the discussion notes that Noel has prepared for us so we can all have a say. Yeah. Thank you so much, James, for taking on the role of the moderator. And thank you, Stephen, for the opening. It's that's a good start. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm an entre entrepreneur based in California. Um, I believe we're going to discuss a very relevant and important topic uh, in this panel because around where I live, the United States, there have been fierce calls for racial justice, conflicts escalating in different cities, and uh, 
the current election is definitely incorporating this as one of the major points of debate. I mean, if you watched the presidential debate a couple of days ago, it was quite obvious. So I believe if we look beyond the surface, we're dealing with a very complex combination of historical issues, uh, policy issues, economic issues, and even technological issues that have to do with how perceptions are shaped and how the growth and gains of our society could be distributed, which uh, I'm afraid to say in its current form is exacerbating inequality in many ways. Um, while some of them more targeted towards some uh, minority groups, some across the board through different social economic classes. So uh, this is just the beginning session section. So when we get into the details, I'd love to explore um, different approaches to analyzing this subject. For example, how uh, racism and racist sentiments uh, were originated, how uh, certain historical factors of discrimination still permeates our society today, how the progress and the gains of our uh, economy could be better directed to um, strengthen the well-beings of people. And uh, maybe, uh, as Stephen said, we have to talk about concrete actions beyond protests. So um, maybe talk about some specific potential solutions to at least start alleviating inequality. Um, well, one of which I'm particularly a fan of, which is the concept of a universal basic income. Um, it's gaining momentum in the U.S. and uh, in other countries worldwide as well, but carries uh, many misconceptions still. So I'd like to explore that as uh, one of the tools to uh, equalize the, the gap between different uh, groups. So, yeah, thank you. I'll pass the mic to uh, back to James or to Anino. Well, no, I think uh, very good. I think we're definitely going to discuss universal basic income later on in the panel. Um, and I do also want to open up uh, the, the, we can see the comments uh, on the side as well. So uh, during, throughout the discussion, please feel free to put your comments along the side so we can answer them uh, near the end if we have time. And, you know, please, I'm looking forward to hearing all about you, please. <laughs> well, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us at this panel. My name is Anino Emua. I'm an international management consultant. <laughs> I am the founder of a consulting firm in France called Avondis Consulting. We deal with strategy and financial advisory, working with entrepreneurs and uh, business leaders. We also run communities of women in business leadership at Davos, at um, Unger, and also the Africa Women CEUs Network. Now, um, I come into this topic uh, from the economist standpoint, uh, which is uh, my historic roots. I studied um, economics at the London School of Economics. And, you know, um, as I think many of us listening would know, it's a school that is very well is known in terms of um, uh, social justice. And um, the issue of um, Black Lives um, Matter, the movement, and in the way in which this um, um, panel is um, described, um, is the awareness that has been um, brought about through this um, pandemic, um, through the pandemic, in the sense of inequalities and uh, just as uh, Stephen set out, um, the inequalities, of course, with Black, black Lives move, Movement had to do with um, racial inequalities. But that has drawn an awareness worldwide of all kinds of inequalities and injustices. And I think that um, that awareness has been critical and it's um, really very important. Uh, that is, wherever it is we are in the world today, and for example, I've had the um, opportunity to live and work in um, six countries of the world, two in Africa and um, four in, um, in Europe and in France where I'm living uh, right now. And um, I think that when we're looking at the, you know, the issues of inequalities, we have to be careful in the way in which we define inequality. And um, you know, St Stephen has started talking about that. I don't want to talk too much because we'll have time to talk about it. But I think what we need to bear in mind is this, is you know, um, what are the sources of inequalities? What exactly are we talking about? How do we measure it? And, you know, as we know, and uh, the professor will, will let us know that changing mindsets is not going to happen overnight. OK, it's something that's, that's going to take you know, a very long time. But having said so, there are certain things that, you know, we can do. And I think I'll leave it at that and probably, you know, have some time to talk about that in more detail as we go along in the panel. 
Thank you. That's, no, thank you very much. Um, that's actually a perfect introduction to uh, what Noel had prepared for us as our first discussion point. Um, before I quickly get onto that, I will quickly introduce myself as because I realise I've been <laughs> letting everyone out have a uh, talk, and I haven't uh, haven't yet mentioned myself. I, I'm James Kong. Uh, I'm the 79th director of Confucius, and I also work as a football agent. Um, and uh, I, I'll be trying to help uh, moderate this panel alongside my fellow, fellow pal panelists, uh, since Noel has uh, been unable to make it. But as you said, uh, interestingly, about the definition of inequality, I think this is one thing that is very, very key for us to discuss is what I've found is people don't really seem to understand certain definitions or there's a an argument in, about what a certain word means in terms of racism. What is racism? I, I remember when I was racially abused and people said, oh, it's a joke. And it wasn't a joke to me. And I said, no, he's, he's a racist. And they went, no, he's not a racist. I, I, we have slightly de different definitions of racist here. So I think um, Noel has as a, a first discussion point is um, we define inequality, discrimination and minorities in simple terms so that we don't spend previous. Oh, yeah. So let's please uh, define inequality, discrimination and minorities in simple terms so that we don't uh, spend too much time on specific definitions later on. Uh, Stephen, why don't you uh, begin? Well, I think it's important to draw a distinction between discrimination and inequality because discrimination is a difference in treatment that lacks any justification. and uh, Not every inequality um, is incapable of being justified. In other words, there are all, are all kinds of inequalities that are appropriate and even necessary. For example, in, in, it, it's, not, it's not a realistic objective that everybody has the same income, for example. I mean, there are reasons why we pay certain people more than others. And if you allow the, uh, the market, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in the democratically regulated market um, rather than either command economies or a totally free market. If you allow the market to operate, you will find that people want to pay Kim Kardashian however much she, she earns, um, even though in my estimation by any reasonable standard she's not worth it. But um, <laughs> you can't, you can't, the, reason, the, only way you can, the only way you can interfere with that is through taxation. And then that gets you into debates about how much people should pay in tax and why and so on and so forth. So there will be, I think, even in a, a totally fair system, there will be um, inequalities in, in, in wealth. I like John Rawls' uh, um, take on this, which is to say that every you know incremental increases in wealth have got to be tagged to the lower the lower paid. So the, the more the people increase their wealth, the more they sort of drag up the people who are at the bottom. And that, that is basically the principle of progressive taxation. And, and I think that's the best you can do, really, in these circumstances. As far as other uh, issues are concerned, opportunities are very important. It's very important to have, um, um, you know, the talents are uneven, unevenly distributed. Some people are gifted at football or music or whatever language it may be, and some people are not. And you've, you've got to try and figure that out where that takes them in terms of um, fulfilment and everything else. So I think it's all very complicated, but I, I tend to want to pin my mast to my colours to the mast of discrimination rather than inequality. Right. Yeah, I um, I'll chime in quickly here as well. I I I think that uh, inequality. I think we all strive for inequality of opportunity. I think uh, the idea of inequality of outcome is uh, unachievable, as you said. Um, and um, hopefully we can we can create as close to uh, equality of opportunity as as we can get in in our society. Um, because as you said, there are many talented people um, who deserve to be put on a level playing field as other people. And I think that's one reason I love football in general is, uh, it is a, it's a world sport. Uh, it's from any background, from anywhere you can become a professional football player with a lot of hard work and talent. Um, and that's one of the reasons I love it. There is some, uh, some prejudice, prejudice, uh, still in the sport, um, uh, that should be eradicated at the top level. Oh, oh, there oh you joined us. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we are yeah. on your yes, first discussion points. Um, I'm just finishing mine. I, I had I had, I had a put off system. I had a put off system collapse. 
and no. um, I had to get a new laptop and all that. And um, no. I, I'm, I'm so sorry about it's this. It's all right. We're we're here with a with a live audience. So I um I'm just we're just on discussion point one uh, of your amazing okay. notes that you prepared for us. So. So yeah, so I think equality of opportunity is very important, um, and I think you know it, it's not it should eradicate any sort of prejudice and discrimination that uh, that is there. Um, if we have equality of opportunity, then uh, I think race shouldn't really come into it at all. Um, Alec, and then sorry, um, it, how, how do you say your name? Is it Night? Noel, can she hear us? Hello, Anino. Anino, Anino, that's it. Anino. Okay, so I'm Alec. sorry. Okay, sorry, Alec, and then Anino, and then Noel. Uh, please take over. Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll All just right. keep it quick because we have the majority of the discussion still happening uh, afterwards. Uh, very little to add to uh, your very academic and experienced. Uh, input already, but discrimination is based on uh, prejudice, which is an attitude towards another group of people, as you said, unjustified. And in terms of e e equality and inequality, uh, we're not looking to have a completely equal outcome, but uh, equal opportunity, as James mentioned. And in this picture, um, minorities are oftentimes the victims when we talk about uh, discrimination, but also, as Stephen mentioned, there are historical uh, examples of dominant minorities. Uh, so for the sake of our discussion here, I believe we're mostly talking about disadvantaged minority groups, for example, African Americans in the United, in the United States. Um, I'll leave it like, uh, there. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I will add very little to that as well, except to say when we talk about, for example, racism, you know, or, or uh, discrimination in that way. Um, for the average man on the street, we tend, it's ten, you tend to look at it as one person being, or one person or one group being negative about another group. Mm. What we don't actually see, and sometimes it's actually even, it's really even worse, is the institutionalized racism. We often look at racism as something that somebody is actually doing but without actually realizing that there's systems in place that have been built on, on racist um, decisions in, in historically in the past, and those create institutionalized racism. And I think it's very important, and that's what we've seen through the Black, Life, um, Black Lives Movement in America, and look at it, it as a case study, not just for America, but elsewhere, and how do institutions, so it could be laws, it could be policies, it could be um, you know, programs, how do those actually enforce and create and reduce opportunities for certain minority groups? Thank you very much, Anino. Um, I apologize once again to the to the distinguished audience for my system collapse and everything that happened. Uh, I, I just want to start from where I should have started from if I if I was here from right from the beginning, and highlight um, a racial discrimination issue I faced some years ago on a personal level. I flew into Luxembourg in 2011, and I came for a Horasis event, coincidentally. Um, where I was invited by the government of Luxembourg and, and Horasis to speak at that meeting. And when I came in, I checked into my hotel room, and I was about to take a walk around the city. As I was, as I was about to leave, something told me to take my passport and my document in my jacket. And I, was, and I couldn't imagine what kind of voice was... Oh. Okay. I hope he's not crashed. <laughs> um, Telling me that. So I. Oh, he's back. You can hear yeah, you me now. You couldn't yes, imagine you can. what voice. Can you hear me now? Yes. You're back. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So I, I came into Luxembourg for an event, and immediately I came in, I was about to take a walk around the city from my hotel room. And a voice told me to take my passport and my invitation letter. And I found it kind of curious, but I just decided, okay, I put it in my, my jacket and I took a walk. And after I walked for a while, I was a bit tired. I decided to go to a bus station and take a bus that was going to take me back to my hotel. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Can you hear me still? All right. Yes, now, right yes. at the bus station, I, I, met an American, I met an American student and we got into a conversation. 
and she told me she was from the US. She came for, for studies and she asked me where I was from. And immediately I said I was from Nigeria, a particular lady who was standing in front of me started screaming and started hurling discriminatory words against me, calling Nigerians criminals, calling Nigerians thieves, and how could I be from such a country? And immediately she said that I was shocked and everybody in the bus station could hear her voice because she was quite loud. And I remember that my passport and my invitation letter was in my jacket. I reached out for my, for my invitation letter and handed it over to her. She read it and saw that I came for a very important issue in Luxembourg. And immediately she started trying to apologize. And I saw that as a learning, as a, as a teaching moment. Oh. I'm sure you'll come back around. Oh, oh maybe, maybe not. <laughs> no, are you there? Back um, to you, James. Yeah, I'm sorry about this. Um, so I think, uh, uh, is he coming back? Okay, no. Um, I, oh, no, he is back. There we are. No, he's not. Okay. Oh, uh, no, he's not. <laughs> That was a that was a huge range of emotions. Um, emotions. I think let's move on then to uh, question number two, or discussion point number two. Uh, Black Lives Matter is a cry for equal power and opportunities for ni minorities across the globe. Oh, he is back. Oh, Hi. This is terrible. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now so, I think if you quickly finish off, so that we can move on to the other discussion points. Yeah. So what I was trying to what I was trying to say is um, certain people from certain parts of the globe, you know, are ascribed certain privileges or not ascribed certain privileges because of where they're from, how they look, how they speak, and how they culturally associate with other people. Um, I, I would I would go back to Anino because I, I, I wanted to hear from you. You are an entrepreneur practicing business across the globe in different countries. What has it been like for you? What has your, experience, your personal experience been like, you know, from an entrepreneur's perspective? What are the hurdles you had to face as a black woman trying to carry out your business activities in a white man's land? Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that. And, you know, it's interesting because um, I think all, all along my life, I have never really thought about in terms, in terms of, you know, uh, discrimination, you know, I studied in the UK, I was there for 10 years and, you know, I got, you know, my degrees all in the UK. And, you know, very often as a woman, you know, you're the minority in, um, you know, certain fields, especially economics where I studied. But I never really looked like that. I, it, that was you know, only in, in fairly recent years that I did. And, you know, I always, I think is the entrepreneur in me that you're always looking at opportunities, okay, because there are always a huge range of obstacles. So that was only ever one type of obstacle. So, for example, I remember one example was this, and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't even call it necessarily, um, you know, to do with um, uh, discrimination. But when I was starting my business, and you know, I went to the bank, you know, in um, in France, and um, you know, and I tried to open an account, and the kinds of questions that were, you know, being asked, you know, and I said, all I want to do is open an account. I'm not asking to um, borrow money or anything. And um, I found that sort of very curious, but I had my lawyer who had my back, you know, and, you know, once they heard that there was an issue, they just said to me, shall we, do you have any reason to work with this bank? We'll move you to another bank. So the, it's, it has always been, you know, looking for where the opportunity is and solving the, solving the, solving the, the problem, you know, solving the issue. So I think I've all, I'm always taken that perspective, you know, and not focused on what I saw as, you know, um, obstacles, but always looking. And, you know, very often, you know, every time, you know, where, very often there's a block, you always see that, you know, very often there's actually a path. OK, so it's always focusing on the paths and, you know, um, very much less on those um, obstacles. Oh, on again. Well, um, thank you for that very positive um, uh, message there. And, you know, that was uh, very good. I think uh, that's the right way to, to approach life in general. It's always trying to focus on those opportunities, especially at a period like this during COVID. It's uh, very, very difficult. Um, so just to move on to the dis second discussion point, um, which I think is open to everybody. Um, Black Lives Matter is a cry for equal power and opportunities for minorities across the globe. 
weak national political and legal frameworks in many countries constantly try to push minority populations uh, underwater. Uh, how is this a view, uh, how has this evolved over years over the years? How has uh, the Black Lives Matter movement how has this, this uh, yes how has this frustration and anger built up through the years and uh, I think this is open for everybody. So I'd like to uh, just continue on from Anino's opening uh, remark when she mentioned the uh, systemic racism versus what individuals actually do or don't do. So um, while prejudice is an, uh, is an attitude towards another group of people, most people who carry prejudice don't necessarily uh, act upon them by taking discriminatory actions. However, if there is uh, a political candidate, a product advertisement, or a uh, policy proposal that echoes with the prejudice they already have, it's more likely to gain their support. And that's been repeatedly used throughout history for people to instill certain ideas and images about others in order to create a, a narrative to help achieve certain agenda. And if we think about it, that's how racism and racist sentiments were originated. Take uh, slavery, for example, in the United States. From the point of view of the landowners, it was necessary to own slaves and operate because of, um, you know, to increase production. So this economic demand not only led to uh, more business activity of slave trading, it also led to the narrative that these people were uh, yeah. far inferior from Africa, so their abuse were justified on a moral uh, level. And uh, even though the stories being used, like they were uh, ba uh, bad people or not intelligent, were completely based on falsehood, once the story takes hold and become part of people's belief system, um, it's just taken as a fact. And there, and some of them are um, more subtle ways, some more direct ways. But um, but in the subsequent years, hundreds of years, there are policies, cultural contents, and actions that further solidify this notion, which led to a history of um, a, a continued and evolving suppression of African Americans in the United States, despite um, various gains being made, like uh, different rights uh, being created. That's why, you know, when we see politicians make speeches and they often say um, America is not a racist country. On one hand, I tell myself it's a very triumphant declaration. On the other hand, there are so many um, things from popular belief to statistics that are worth taking a closer look at to really have a sense of what state we are in. For example, mm -hmm. why is the uh, average net worth for a black family in the U.S.? Only 10% of that of a white family. Why are prison population for black inmates five to 10 times those of white inmates, depending on which state you look at? Uh, why are black individuals perceived as more dangerous, like Noel mentioned in other parts of the world often as well, black neighborhoods as well? Um, and very importantly, why are illegal activities committed by individuals of a minority group very often taken as a representation of their group, uh, like a black criminal or a Muslim terrorist. While on the other hand, uh, uh, instances committed by, for example, white people in many of the mass shootings in the U.S. were mostly attributed to their uh, mental illnesses uh, instead of their group as a projection. So um, while most people, I would agree, in this country are not overtly racist, we do have to acknowledge that racist sentiments, practices, and the policies still permeates our society. And if we simply ignore that and ignore the disadvantaged start starting point many people already have, plus the much stronger headwind they would encounter as they progress through life, if we ignore those and simply call it a post-racial or equal opportunity colorblind society already because we've had a black president, is far from sufficient. So that's my take on the history of racism. I'd, I'd like to add to that, actually. And um, I, I think um, you've, ra you've raised some very important points. One, you know, when you um, look at um, systemic racism, what I think has happened with the Black Lives Movement um, uh, this, this time has been this. 
is that is a recognition that you know if you say you know i am not racist i don't do such and such you know that no longer holds because if you have a system that has that is systemically uh, uh, race in certain ways you are complicit if you don't do anything so it's not enough to say i don't do a b c and d it is in your, your responsibility is what are you doing to dismantle the system that is you know is racist so i think that's one key thing that is really important the second thing just very briefly is to talk about when we look at the um, um you know african diaspora the black people you know ar around the world you know outside you know of you know africa the the diaspora is about uh, 210 million people approximately and that's a huge number you know the the Af you know the african americans afro caribbeans etc and you're talking about all these stories and so we need to hear you know we need to take take hold of our narrative as well and create stories right of success you know more than just the sports and just more than you know um, showbiz etc but you know in business in science you know where you have you know extraordinary um, uh, black talent and create those narratives right to counterbalance the negative narratives so i think that's one thing that you know we can do on our side in terms of you know the minor the the, the minorities in diaspora uh, or other in the you know in the western or advanced or or, or, or whatever is actually take try to take hold of that narrative because you know we are a large community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anino. Um, James, you work in in the sports industry, and um, for a very long time, um, especially from our mock session, you talked about the role of sports personalities, popular sports personalities, in highlighting. Um, racial abuses, um, ethnic discrimination, and all that. What have you seen working in that industry, and how can we leverage the media, sports, arts, and entertainment to further highlight the negatives of discrimination and um, racial injustice across the globe? Thank you. Well, um, actually, just, just today, uh, Sky News, uh, Sky Sports, I should say, have um, started a campaign where the uh, presenters and reporters have united in supporting a new campaign uh, that is uh, raising awareness of online hate and abuse in social media. Um, this is a, just today they've, they've announced it. Uh, I think it coincides with um, Black History Month here as well. Um, and this is great because more than four, 40 million users engage on Sky Sports channels, digital and social media. So that they have a huge amount of uh, of uh, audience that they can influence um so it's, it's going to be very very good in clamping down against online hate uh, as well as what we see in in stadiums and uh, around the world at sporting events um i think sports has a huge role to play um due to the fact it is it, it shouldn't be uh discrimination uh, discriminatory in any way um oh i play in a football team where you know we've got people from multiple races uh and it's a local team so they're all around here but we're all from we're all from different races it, it doesn't really matter i mean we don't we don't go around and start saying how many people we have from different races if i think about it now i'm probably the only chinese one there but i don't I, it's not thought about um when you're in a in a premier league team the team is works together as a team always and it's about the talent and and the teamwork um and everyone will work together when when you see uh, at a world cup there have been uh very very few uh incidents of hate in any sort of way um it's mostly been a lot of people working together and appreciating everybody's differences um that being said outside of these events outside of the big events there have been many many incidents racial incidents which need to be clamped down on and i think fifa and uefa need to do a whole lot more in terms of actually uh clamping down on those specific situations for example in october 14 uh 2019 last year uh, in a qualifier against bulgaria um the, the, there were monkey chants and Nazi salutes towards uh, players such as Myron Ting, My, uh, Tyrone Mings, uh, Raheem Sterling and Marcus Rashford. And the punishment was only one match stadium ban and a, f a fine of $83,000, which was <laughs> basically nothing um, and does not nearly do enough. Um, actually, the panel, the, 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 the panel that's set up to deal with these... Uh, these incidents is completely uh, white. I'm not saying that that is um, 
I think we shouldn't really be looking so much at everyone's race, in my opinion. I would love that we didn't have any uh, see any sort of race in, in any issue. But the fact is, they have never really seemed to have experienced it because their fines do not match what is happening. Uh, it's not clamping down enough on it, in my opinion. Um, the the director of QPR football, uh, director of football for QPR, Les Ferdinand, uh, said that uh, you know UEFA and FIFA might as well have just stood in the stands with those people making those chants. So more needs to be done for sure. More needs to be done. But those outside of those incidents, we see a lot of positive, positive, positive. Um, uh, people coming together at these big events and it's it's beautiful it's really beautiful for me fantastic thank you very much um alpha welcome and uh, i'll be i'll be i'll be taking this question straight to you um and after after you after you've responded we can now have a general discussion on it it's on universal basic income the issue of universal basic income and um it, the possibility of ubi wiping out global inequality and uh, what is your view concerning this? Is UBI something we should be looking at right now? Uh, from the 1970s, UBI has been tested in, in America, in Canada, and has been tested in India, currently being tested in Germany. Uh, do you think this is a workable strategy? Would it decrease global productivity? How do nations pay for UBI? Alpha. Uh, thank you and apologies. Uh, time time zone mix up on my part, uh, but um, I will uh, answer the question by saying that I think UBI and other social safety net considerations uh, should be top of the agenda for uh, for nations uh, looking at stabilizing a workforce uh, globally particularly given the trends that we're seeing in exponential technologies and the dislocation of workers. And I think this pandemic in particular has drawn a very bright light around who will have access to the kind of quality of life and jobs and who will not. And the kind of inequities that have been accelerated and made very visible by COVID is the fact that uh, digital um, transformation and the ability of uh, some people to be able to work from uh, home or remotely or to do what we do, knowing that the vast majority of the world's population doesn't have access uh, to both the technologies and the kinds of roles that we're uh, saying uh, uh, could be financially remunerative. So uh, the question of UBI in terms of in a financialized world, giving people the, you know, the survival tools really to be able to have livelihood and be able to uh, consume the kinds of products or experiences, including educational upskilling and other uh, talent development strategies uh, would be bolstered if there is a baseline of uh, social safety net. And I think UBI can provide that. But I don't think it can. It should be uh, relied on as a sole strategy. I think uh, there needs to be still uh, the ability for people to find dignified um, roles that they're playing uh, in their and building up of their uh, businesses, their communities, their livelihood, and there are really serious problems we have to solve. And those problems are currently externalities that we can look at as unstructured work. And so the work of structuring that work of how we bring about environmental sustainability and address some of the big massive issues we have in reforming and rebuilding our institutions still needs to be structured and paid for in ways that can uh, enable people to have a sense of dignity, progress and um, you know, activating their full potential. So UBI plus should be our strategy, but we do need a base safety net. All right, we have just three minutes left. And um, if you have any questions, any questions from the audience, you could just send it through and I would put it um, to any of the panelists. But Steve, let us hear from you in, in about 30 seconds. What, what is your, what's your perspective on UBI? After Steve, I want to hear from Alec, then Anino, and, um, and um, James. Well, um, I'm a lawyer, not an economist, so I don't really have a, a, any expertise about it. But I will say something about um, um, the role of law and economics. Um, I think legislation is a key element in combating discrimination and disadvantage of all kinds. Um, well, one of my personal experience about this is that the um, 
in my youth, it wasn't uncommon in London in the 1970s to see building sites which said no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And this is, of course, I, I'm Irish. This is, of course, now illegal. And since the 1970s, the UK has passed a whole battery of anti-discrimination law. But law in itself is not a complete solution because law is not self-executing. It needs to be enforced at the instigation of victims of discrimination and also by official agencies charged with ensuring systemic compliance. And, of course, the, the social dimension is extremely important as well. Um, you need education. People need to be educated. Um, and I, I, unfortunately, I think the problem of racism is is very, very deep in the human experience. I mean, those of us who are um, not racist uh, have probably liberated ourselves from it through all kinds of by all kinds of means. But I think um, it's got to do with kinship and difference, and when people live apart from each other, uh, and they're they're deeply embedded in a kinship group and network they're more likely to be racist than if they live in cosmopolitan environments. So that that's a big challenge, I think. And, of course, the increasing in the world is cosmopolitan, so that, that's, that's the dynamic that tends to uh, mitigate um, military. Oh, I'm sorry, it took so long. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, Alec, any last I'll words? Just, uh, I'll just continue what uh, Alpha said. Uh, UBI would be uh, providing a floor for the people to pursue things that are meaningful for them, like advancing their education, uh, taking care of people or starting a business without the fear that it will go completely bankrupt. Um, I'll just focus the limited amount of time on how to pay for it. And I think uh, if we're able to structure a UBI program properly, it's able to, first of all, replace many of the existing but inefficient programs. It saves a lot of administrative uh, resources. In addition, our tax system has to find a way to close loopholes, eliminate unfair subsidies that only exist as a result of uh, lobbying efforts. We have to also find reasonable ways to tax uh, profit from rent-seeking monopoly, offshore tax avoidance strategies, and uh, uh, outsized inheritance. Frankly, those have to be those have to be done if we want to reverse course on inequality. Anyway, so I'll just do that. Anino. Anino. Mine is just very simple. I think we need to adopt we need to adopt this move from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. James, any last words? Uh, for me, it's just uh, we need to take uh, action in terms of the Barclays Premier League, especially, especially they need to start to clamp down on racist incidents more uh, so that it's not just taking a knee or having no room for racism on the back of a shirt, but it's actual action rather than just symbolic. Thank you very much. We have just 17, 16 seconds left. Uh, I thank you all for listening. We can't really take any more questions now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for well, taking Thank part. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. All right, bye-bye. Oh, look. Oh, wait, what's the okay. line? I'm, I'm, I'm starting a groupy, group picture request. You can... Click, take yeah. your picture. Can I, it. It, it says we're still live, technically. Are we? Yeah. We are. So, so we're not cut off. We're not cut off. Okay. Okay. No. okay. We're, taking... <laughs> we're meant to be cut off. I thought. I thought we were. I thought we were going to be cut off. That's uh That I think people are leaving though, probably for, to go to the next talk. So, um, if if maybe if anyone has any questions, maybe we can answer any questions. Yeah, if, if anybody in the audience has a question, you could just send it in I, and I could put it to any of the panelists. I, 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 I don't think the system would work after 45 minutes. Maybe it maybe maybe we are off. Uh, let's let's see. I, I think, I think um, we are off. I think I we think are off. off. We, we must be because. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> We're off. We're off. Yeah, we're off. Well, apologies, wow. my fellow panelists. I I thought we we're starting literally at one thirty, so I have my alarm set up here. I had totally gotten my Central European time conversion wrong, and I was coming in early to check it out. And I was like, oh, nice. "Wow!" No, no, we're not. Look, Alpha, 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 you, you don't have. I, I will, I will make it, Alpha. Um, I, 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 sorry, guys, just to say, we are not actually off. We are still on. If we would like to continue, uh, we are welcome. Sonja just, uh, has just written in the chat. Oh, fantastic. Okay, then, let's let's go ahead then. I think, um, Alpha? 
Yes. Let me put this question to you. Um, what COVID-19 has done basically is to expose the institutional deficiencies um, when it comes to a lot of things concerning the handling of minorities. Um, in, in the United States, for instance, blacks are four times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared to their white counterparts. And you can tie that to, you know, an, an, an inability to access quality and affordable health care. Uh, you can tie that to poverty within the black communities and, um, and all of that. What do you think can be done uh, from an institutional perspective? Because we all know that it's very difficult, very, very difficult to, to track and attack and solve the problem of systemic um, discrimination and, and, um, and bias. So what do you think we can do, judging from coming from a social innovation perspective, Rising Tide Capital, which you belong to, has been involved in a lot of social innovation activities across the United States, which give you a lot of recognition. Um, what do you think can be done? What has your company been doing as a social innovation driven organization? What have you been doing and how can we replicate that model across the globe? Uh, well, uh, great. Thank you for uh, the question. I will say that uh, definitely the systemic inequities that have been historical in nature and unaddressed, uh, particularly in the context of the U.S., uh, where I've been working for 16 years at the intersection of these issues, um, has, uh, has in many ways given us an opportunity to have very transparent conversations about where the institutional dynamics, uh, the policy, the ideological uh, challenges are in, in us being able to have a mindset to solve uh, for them. Uh, one thing that I will point to from, from our work is that there is a, an unanswered uh, both uh, ambition as well as uh, mandate, which is many uh, minorities and particularly uh, Black Americans uh, want to have uh, the ability to self-determine what their economic path and livelihood for themselves, their families could be. And there are historic reasons for wanting this self-determination, uh, including a basic lack of trust that the institutions and the systems and the rules, the policies that are in play are either not being enforced equitably or that there are systemic barriers for their participation in that self-determination. And so I'll give you a very concrete example in the case of this pandemic. Uh, you take a sector like the child care sector, which is in free fall right now and has huge ramifications for minorities uh, as well as for, for women. Uh, the child care sector, multi-billion dollar sector, is by and large uh, made up of uh, child care centers and family care providers. And these are 94% across the nation, um, in the small micro businesses that are led by women and people of color. And the lack of investment, the lack of serious uh, policy to actually uh, reinforce this uh, entire sector, which is a critical resource, for the rest of the economy, for the rest of the small businesses and you know, for the workforce to be able to get back to work is not something that is being invested in and addressed in the ways that it could be to ensure that there is safe, secure ability for people to uh, have their children be taken care of and educated during this uh, time of immense crisis. And so there are, within the rising tide uh, world and work, uh, I also serve on the Pandemic Relief Fund Board of uh, uh, the, uh, New Jersey. And what we've done is to bring together a collaborative of different institutions that included the voices of the center owners and family care providers, which are essentially micro businesses, their home-based child care uh, centers, uh, to bring them into the table to talk and look at a cost-based accounting and financing of this critical sector, and then look at what are the resources required to actually stabilize it both from policy as well as from philanthropy and other impact investments that are necessary to shore up this, uh, this sector. And so that is, I know it sounds complicated and time intensive, but it is what it takes is to have the stakeholders at the table to address a very critical and universally shared need, and then to look at the fact that we need to transform that sector anyway, 
for a thriving, inclusive future economy, and that there are opportunities and people who are uh, doing that work, but are hugely underfinanced and unaddressed by policy in the ways that they need to. So you can go sector by sector and look at what does this look like for housing? What does it look like for uh, construction and trades and the built environment? And say, what does it look like for people of color to have the kind of opportunities, the training and support, which is what Rising Tide provides, and access to capital and markets to meet their basic needs in a way that allows them to determine uh, and bring really their resiliency and the, their talents uh, to the table for helping us solve much bigger problems. So that's, you know, in, in a nutshell, what I will say, I will also say that we've seen a lot of innovation amongst our entrepreneurs, and there's also a lot of compassion by our entrepreneurs, you know, a sewing circle came together of all the seamstresses and those, the tailors, et cetera, who are rising tide entrepreneurs. And they started making uh, sewing uh, masks for people that are likely to be invisible and missed by any PPE interventions, for example, the homeless, the indigent and et cetera, and started making it and dropping it off in boxes and hospitals and shelters. And so there is tremendous leadership capacity that is invisible or unrecognized by white-led institutions and policies that need to be shifted and enforced in order for us to create the kind of conditions for future economic or uh, just human success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Alec, you want to add something to that? Well, I think um, in terms of what we can do, I think at this point, um, History is more important than ever. Not only must we look back and uh, see why certain things exist the, the way they do, um, for example, black poverty, racism, uh, we also have to use it as a reference in terms of what would happen if, um, if class division, inequality, racial tension become too stark. What would happen if uh, extreme forms of uh, populism take hold and uh, we have to figure out what the roles for government enterprises and individuals uh, be to make necessary changes. And in terms of uh, us as individuals, not only must we uh, educate ourselves, voice our opinions in our communities uh, and our spheres of influence, we have to work on uh, electing people to power. And that goes with uh, what uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, the actual actions beyond protest. Uh, you like people to power those who actually share uh, anti-racist views and uh, against inequality to translate those views into policies. And over the long run, we have to uh, tackle the income and wealth inequality uh, the, the, in the way that's uh, becoming too stark and too unfair uh, 